Dear colleagues, welcome to this presentation on pelvic floor ultrasound, past, present and future. My name is Hugh van der Vaart and I'm a urogynecology professor at the University Medical Center in Utrecht in the Netherlands. These are my disclosures. Unfortunately, we are not able to see each other in a direct presentation. I always look forward to have a discussion after the presentation or during the presentation about what I have to tell you, I have to present to you, and it always uh, gives me a lot of pleasure to share our ideas and hopefully look for future collaborations. But unfortunately, today it will be a one-way. These are my disclosures. So when did my interest in pelvic floor ultrasound start? Well, it started back in 1993 with the publication by Abdul Sultan in the New England Journal of Medicine on the anal sphincter disruption during vaginal delivery. And he showed that with the use of endoanal ultrasound, 35% of nulliparous women and 44% of multiparous women had an anal sphincter rupture. This is in sharp contrast to what we see on the delivery ward. In this publication, only 3% of women were found to have an anal sphincter rupture at the delivery ward. And this is, uh, again, in sharp contrast to the ultrasound findings. And this study explained a lot of uh, uh, things about anal incontinence for me, uh, because we know that a lot of women experience anal incontinence, especially flatus incontinence, but we didn't understand it quite well. And using the ultrasound, seeing that there is more going on below the surface than we see was really helpful. I also have to acknowledge uh, Hans-Peter Dietz, uh, who introduced us to the 3D pelvic floor ultrasound. And everyone who is listening to this uh, presentation, I would encourage them to look at these papers and especially at these reviews, because there are a lot of interesting things going on. Um, and he's well known for his, uh, for his research. So recognizing that birth trauma is not only to the anal sphincter, but also to the pelvic floor made a lot of um, uh, change in my, my way of thinking about the pelvic floor. So today I want to address with you the subject of what else can ultrasound techniques offer us as clinicians, because these two papers and all the papers by Hans Peter Dietz are mainly research papers. So how can ultrasound imaging be of value? And first of all, the term value is uh, a lot of use nowadays, especially uh, in the context of value-based healthcare, which means that everything that we do have to be weighted against the health gain and the costs about it. One of the examples of the last years is, for instance, the performance of urodynamic investigation in uncomplicated stress urinary incontinence, in which we showed in several RCTs that there is no benefit for the patient by performing urodynamics. In that case, the removal of urodynamics from the diagnostic path will decrease the cost and will increase the value, the health gain. But with respect to the ultrasound imaging, how can it be of value? And I decided to mark this presentation into three categories. One, the anatomical insight. How can it use? Can it help us knowing why diseases develop? Or can it help us the anatomy selecting a proper uh, patient specific treatment? But it can also provide us with structural information, which I will uh, discuss later on, and with functional information about the pelvic floor. So with respect to anatomical insights, where can it be used for? Well, first of all, I discussed the anal incontinence. Knowing that there's an anal sphincter rupture, really increased our knowledge about the pathophysiology of the uh, anal incontinence. Um, with respect to the levator ani avulsion and the distension that occurs during Vesalva in women with major lanar levator ani avulsion defects, really increased and really um, added to our knowledge uh, about how and why pelvic organ prolapse uh, occurs. With respect to stress urinary incontinence, there's a lot of studies being done on the location of the bladder neck and the movement on the bladder neck. But in my opinion, stress urinary incontinence is still a clinical diagnosis. So can we use the anatomical insight that we have for patient-specific treatment? 
So are we able to use the anatomical information for adequate patient selection or offering them a treatment that is tailor-made? So that is something that needs to be seen. I want to progress with some slides about the ultrasound of the pelvic floor for those who are not yet familiar to this subject. Over here you can see an ultrasound of the anal sphincter complex and I just marked the white part which is the external anal sphincter. And you can see that it is circular and it's all completely closed. On the inner aspect of it you can see a so a, 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 a black line, uh, which is also closed, and that represents the internal anal sphincter. On the other picture, you can see, again, an ultrasound of the pelvic floor, which you can see that the external anal sphincter is ruptured. In this part, it's incomplete, it's not closed, and also the internal anal sphincter is not completely closed, and it's thinner than in the other picture. Moving to 3D ultrasound of the pelvic floor and with uh, respect to the work by Hans-Peter Dietz, you can see over here an ultrasound picture in which you can see the pubic bone almost closed here. And this complex, this white complex, is the levator ani with the anal canal, the vagina and the ureter in front of it, ureter in front of it. This is completely closed in contrast to the picture over here, in which you can see that the levator ani is still visible over here, but there seems to be a quite large gap uh, on the uh, right side of your picture, on the left side of the patient in real time. And this final picture shows you a levator ani complex that is only visible over here, so there are large defects on this side and large defects on the other side. So this imaging improved our understanding what is happening during and after childbirth to the pelvic floor. And it also helps us uh, thinking about the pathophysiology of pelvic organ problems. With respect to the clinical application at present for stress urinary incontinence, and I think that we mainly focus on the complications that we see after the mid urethral sling problems uh, 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 placement. On the picture over here, you can see that the urethra, the vagina, and the rectum is visible, but also that the mid-urethral sling, which is uh, the white line that you see below the urethra, that's over here, is clearly demarked on the ultrasound. So you can visualize it that in a nice way. And one of the things that we are looking at right now is the distance between the sling and the pubic bone in order to look for the pathophysiology of complications after sling surgery. And at this moment, it's advocated that the distance should be between 8 or 14 millimeters. Uh, distance below the 8 millimeters is, is, uh, is, is quite um, uh, small and could give rise to uh, outflow obstruction. And distances above the 40 millimeters are known to have less results on uh, special urinary incontinence after the surgery. The clinical applications are present for fecal incontinence, and this I think is an interesting one because we know for 27 years already what is happening to the sphincter. So there is a clear association between OAC and fecal incontinence, and we have identified that there are occult anal sphincter injuries, but what we do with them is still under debate. Do you repair? Um, anal sphincter rupture that you have diagnosed with endoanal ultrasound, let's say three or four or six months after delivery? I do not, but perhaps we should. I don't know. That's point of discussion. And there's also a debate about the use of ultrasound in diagnosing anal sphincter injuries and recommendation about the future delivery. Should the women be able to have a vaginal delivery or should she have a cesarean in the future? Um, the debate is still going on. There are also some algorithms that, uh, that are used in practice, but we have to recognize that even 27 years after Sultan's initial publication, we still are working on how we can apply this into the clinical practice. So how about the clinical application at present for pelvic organ prolapse? The work by Dietz clearly showed that levator avulsions and ballooning, and ballooning means that 
during Fazalfa, the genital hiatus in area increases above the 25 square centimeters, that they are both associated with an increased risk of anatomical recurrence of pop after surgery, and especially the cystocele. But there is no clear cutoff in which we can identify women with a high risk and identify women with a low risk. So there will still be some debate on how we use the ultrasound for this purpose. Recognizing this, this we need to be aware that we should work together and we should gather international data and a lot of data to understand how the pelvic floor ultrasound data, especially on the damage that we see, can be incorporated into our prediction models to be of benefit to our patients. And the key factor in this international or this data collection uh, within a country is that we have to look for a system that is reliable and we have to standardize things. So how about the reliability of the translabel ultrasound for detecting levator ani defects? Kim Notte had a review in uh, 20, to, uh, 2017 uh, published in which she looked at the diagnostic accuracy in which she compared the diagnosis of levator ani defects on translabel ultrasounds with uh, MRI. And she showed that there was a moderate to good agreement between the two ways of uh, imaging techniques of diagnosing the vitro avulsions. We have to also recognize that in the MRI group, the images were, uh, um, uh, were uh, judged by two uh, radiologists and they also didn't agree on all the MRI pictures, whether or not there was a levator ani avulsion. So also in the MRI group, there is a less reliability between observers than we should, should like to have. She also reported on the inter-observer agreement and she found at that point eight studies in which six were single center and she demonstrated there was a moderate to good to very good agreement between observers and studies. But one of the issues that she raised was that these studies are most often single center and there is one expert in the field as, as co-author. So it raises the question whether or not this is generalizable and if we can have ultrasound pictures judged in the same way when we have different uh, investigators and different uh, observers from, from, from different um, uh, hospitals. We worked on that and we published a paper in 2014 in which we had uh, pictures of women of their pelvic floor, uh, the whole volumes, and they were uh, presented to five observers uh, in order to have them judge whether or not there were levator A9 avulsions, uh, unilateral or bilateral, uh, to be detected. And all were well trained observers, and two of the observers were from one center. Uh, in which one, the expert in the field, had already trained the other one. And to our surprise, we found very poor Cohen Kappa. So we found very poor inter observer uh, uh, re uh, reliability when observers from different centers looked at the levator A hyophilogens. And the only one that is uh, a good, uh, the 0 0.72, came from the two observers that were in one center, in which the one trained the other. This paper was highly debated. Uh, we did the ultrasound six months after delivery, so it could be that there is an effect on delivery uh, at that stage in which diagnosing levator avulsions, avulsions might be a little bit more problematic. We did not look at the difference between the levator and the urethra, which is now also known as a measure for levator ana avulsion. But anyway, uh, this was something that made us uh, have doubts about the reliability, especially when you have your ultrasound images judged by uh, several uh, observers from different centers. So how can we improve this reliability to allow standard uh, clinical decision making? Well, first of all, the acquisition of the images is vital. Uh, and there is a, a, a very nice protocol uh, produced by IUGA, uh, by the group of uh, Hans-Peter Dietz, uh, which gives us a, a very nice and very uh, thorough uh, guideline in how to uh, um, acquire the images on pelvic floor ultrasound. 
And I think that we all should try to follow that protocol in order to have a standardized way of recording. But then, then we have the recorded images and we still have to recognize that the human eye deceives. And we, it's known that you see what you are, are, are trained to see or, or, or what you want to see. And to give you an example, this is me back in 1993, uh, looking at a picture of Abdul Sultan. And clearly um, I, as a, a, a kitten, want to be the great lion that was there behind the mirror. But I'm also sure that just like me, you see an elephant over here who's got eight legs or are there four. So these are, are two examples that show that the human eye is trained to deceive or might deceive. So this is the big pink elephant in the middle of our room, which we all know there is there, but we do not see the elephant. So how can we improve reliability? First of all, like I said, by standardization of the image acquisition, because that's operator dependent. But after that, I would suggest that we look for techniques in which we analyze the pictures operator independent with the use of artificial intelligence. And that could be the automated selection of the plane of minimal hiatal dimension, uh, which we use to look at the pelvic floor. But it also could mean that we look for automated detection of the elevator ANI by means of deep learning in 2D and 3D. This work uh, we started uh, two years ago with a, a grant of the Dutch uh, Society uh, with uh, Philips and Tomtek as co-sponsors. And we used a convolutional neural network work in order to uh, train the uh, computer in recognizing the right image and identifying the levator ANI. And this is how it works. This is the central network represented as our brain. And this is the data set that the computer gives to you. And we tell the brain that this is what we want to see. So we have a manual uh, gold standard and we tell the brain, this is your data set, put it in and make sure that this is what is coming out. At first, there will be uh, a picture that is not resembling what we want. So the error in what we see in the picture with respect to what we want to see is still too large. At that stage, you go back into the system and you retry and you retry. And at every stage, one of these knots are a little bit adjusted in order to finally get a picture in which the error between what the computer tells us and the manual segmentation is small. The next step is to test this on a testing set, a different part from the training set, in order to see whether or not the system can reproduce itself a nice picture of the elevator A9. So we had a data set of 253 women, which we used for the training and validation, and a part of it for testing, and a second data set of 40 women, which we also used as a test set. So we finally, after development of the algorithm, we had two test sets, a test set one and two, to look if the, uh, the, the algorithm that we developed was right in uh, imaging of the, uh, of the elevator ANI. And we looked for several aspects of the elevator ANI. First, hiatal dimensions. Secondly, the area of the elevator ANI. Um, and then also the elevator ANI, uh, the echogenicity, the, the gray value of the muscle. And we published this in the Ultrasound Obstetrics and Gynecology uh, last year. And we uh, could see that the freely automatic uh, uh, network segmentation was successful in 99% uh, of the images in the test series one and 93% in the test series two. And below you can see the ICC values for the different um, measurements that we took, like the length, the width, and the area of the general genital hiatus the length of the puberectal muscle and also the mean echogenicity and all showed a good to very good agreement. So this was the first step to have the computer recognizing in 2D the levator ANI and apparently our algorithm is uh, good in doing so. But we have to admit that this is still an intact pelvic floor. 
So the next step would be to train the system to recognize the fatal avulsions, avulsions. And the next step would also be to use it in 3D. And this uh, picture is the first example of the, the 3D imaging uh, that we got out of the system uh, a few months ago. But the ultrasound, despite of apart from, from having uh, uh, value in, 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 in anatomical uh, diagnosis, it can also give us structural information about the levator a and muscle. And, and why do we need it? Well, the muscle is uh, composed of muscle tissue and an extracellular matrix, mainly um, connective tissue. And um, the, the balance between those two uh, is really important uh, because in the end, uh, muscle cells, they uh, are necessary, to, it's necessary for the function. And looking at the structural information and more in detail uh, to the ethnicity is already done in uh, neuromuscular diseases in children in which the, um, the gray value is used as a predictor of the progression of the disease. So it might also give us some insight in the pathophysiology of the pelvic floor. So why are there women with uh, apparently perfect uh, pelvic floor anatomy uh, who are not able to contract? Uh, is it because they do not know how to contract? Or is it because there is structural damage to the uh, muscle in which, despite knowing how to contract, the muscle just doesn't react? So these are some of the, uh, um, the possibilities that we have looking at the structure of the, of the muscle. But how do we measure it? Well, we measure it by the echogenicity, which is basically 256 shades of gray. So the mean gray value of a muscle is composed of the muscle cells, which are dark on the ultrasound, and connective tissue, extracellular matrix fat, which appear bright on the ultrasound. And the ergogenicity tells us something about the ratio between the muscle cells and the extracellular matrix. Uh, definitely, the, my uh, biceps muscle will contain much more uh, uh, connective tissue uh, than a muscle uh, cell uh, of, of a muscle of the biceps of, of 20 year old. Um, but we have to recognize that when we look at ergogenicity, it's important to look at the US, uh, the ultrasound setting. Uh, settings uh, because they're dependent. If we increase the gain, we all know we got a wider picture. So doing this research, you make, I need to make sure that all the ultrasound settings are stable. We did a study on the effect of pregnancy and childbirth on the mean ergogenicity of the puberectalis, um, and we recorded uh, ultrasounds of the pelvic floor at 12 and 36 weeks of pregnancy and also six months after delivery. And we uh, split the delivery into vaginal delivery and C-section. And we acquired the top tomographic ultrasound images as, uh, opposed by, uh, as proposed by uh, Hans-Peter Dietz. Uh, first, we, uh, um, we separated the puberectile or the levator anal muscle for, for, for what you want to call it uh, from the rest of the, uh, the image. Uh, by uh, removing the genital hiatus and by cutting off the levator ana from the pubic bone. So we have the V-shape on the right bottom uh, in which we did our uh, calculations on. And this is a, a slide in which you can see the change in pelvic floor ergogenicity uh, between 12 weeks gestation, 36 weeks gestation and after delivery. And what is clear is that the ergogenicity is much higher during pregnancy than after delivery. And one of the explanations is that we know that pregnancy, uh, especially the beginning of pregnancy, there is a, 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 story, a, a stor storage of fat into uh, the, the tissues. So it might be that there is also an increase in fat storage to the uh, pelvic floor muscle, to the muscles or it's an increase in, 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 in collagen um, preparing for, for vaginal delivery. Um, so this gives us at least some insight in what is going on with the structure of the uh, pelvic floor during pregnancy. And I also want to share this one with you, um, uh, which is, I think, very interesting. We also looked at the ergogenicity at 12 week pregnancy and uh, the association with the uh, eventual mode of delivery. And it's very interesting to see that when you have a vaginal delivery or a primary C-section because of brief presentation or an assisted vaginal delivery or a secondary cesarean because of fetal distress, 
that the epigenicity of 12 weeks pregnancy of the muscle is all the same. But there is this group, and this group are the women with a secondary C-section because of uh, uh, an obstructive uh, labor, obstructive dilatation of the cervix or obstructive uh, uh, labor it itself. Uh, and apparently, also already during 12 weeks of pregnancy, their erogenicity is much lower than in the other groups. Um, um, we do not have a clear explanation for this. this. It might be that this represents that there is less collagen uh, available in the pelvic floor muscle in the women who eventually uh, are not able to, uh, to deliver. But uh, this is still on the debate and the group is still uh, small. But it's just an introduction to show you what you can do with uh, echogenicity or with structural information about the muscle. But it can also provide us functional information, and this is what I really want to focus on in this last part of my presentation. When you look at cardiology, strain measurement is one of the key things the uh, physicians uh, do nowadays. Strain of the cardiac uh, muscle in the different uh, parts of the, of the heart. And strain is not more or less than uh, the causation that an object under stress becomes deformed. So it's, it changes from its original form. Um, and when you look at, uh, at strain from a, a point of contraction of a muscle, well, the muscle will become shorter uh, when, you, uh, when you contract it. So the strain value will be negative. And when you uh, push on the pelvic floor muscle, we know that it will enlarge on Vasalva, and then you get a positive strain value. And there are examples from cardiology, for instance, in uh, oncocardiology, in which the strain of the uh, cardiac muscle is measured frequently during uh, chemotherapy in order to look for early signs of uh, failure before you can detect it with blood pressure or other signs. So you might adjust your chemotherapy if there is a large damage occurring during uh, the first uh, gifts. Can we also use it for the pelvic floor, using strain measurements for the pelvic floor? Well, there are several ways to do that. Uh, first of all, you can uh, mark the uh, puborectal muscle by hand, and uh, that's operator dependent. Uh, and then you can segment the midline uh, from that muscle and look at how long it is between rest and contraction and vasalva. So that's one way of doing it. Second way is measuring the area of the genital hiatus in rest, contraction, and the vasalva. But that's also operator dependent. The operator has to draw the lines of the genital hiatus in that uh, perspective. Uh, and there's also, and that's what we're working on right now, an operator independent strain calculation of the levator ani uh, muscle itself. First, if you mark the puborectal uh, muscle or levator ani muscle in this way, uh, and you let the computer draw the midline, you can look at the size, the length of the midline during rest and contraction in order to give a, a, a prediction of the strain. But for instance, uh, in this picture, I probably would have drawn the line over here and might also have drawn the line over here. So this is an indication that it's still operator dependent. These are strain data, again, from the study that we did on pregnancy and delivery. And this is also, I think, interesting when you look at the strain during contraction. You can see that at 12 weeks gestation and 36 weeks, the strain is approximately around 10, 10, 11. And that after women who had a cesarean section, that doesn't change much six months after delivery. But women who delivered vaginally, either spontaneously or with an assisted vaginal delivery, you can see that the strain is significantly less as compared to women who do not have any damage of their pelvic floor. So this is one way in which you can use strain to look at uh, pathophysiology of processes. You can also look at the hiatal area. And this is a study that we did uh, in which one of the researchers had a portable ultrasound machine and she uh, went uh, at home to all the women, there were 20 women in the study, um, uh, who after delivery had a weekly visit by our uh, uh, researcher in order to have a pelvic floor ultrasound uh, at home. So this was a great effort and uh, we recorded the pelvic floor ultrasounds from 12 weeks gestation until 24 weeks after delivery. 
This picture shows the contractility, so the ability of the woman to contract her pelvic floor in a proper way. And you can see that after delivery, there is a period of time uh, in which there is a diminished contractility of the pelvic floor, but after 12 weeks, this is already where, uh, again, up to the normal standard that we call it uh, pre-pregnancy or early in pregnancy, I have to say. And this is completely different for what occurs on Vosalva. Apparently, there is a persistent distensibility, so it's an enlargement of the genital hiatus during Vosalva, which does not return to the normal values. And this is one of the things that is in line with the concept that after delivery, the pelvic floor under strain uh, um, relaxes uh, or needs to relax or cannot, it, it's not able to, uh, to counter force the, the, the strain uh, put on it. And so the genital hiatus becomes larger and in the end um, you can develop uh, symptoms like pelvic organ prolapse. It's also an explanation why there is a time delay between uh, the occurrence of pelvic floor or pelvic organ prolapse and, and the delivery. So there seems to be a permanent damage to the pelvic floor in order uh, to, um, to uh, be able to withhold the abdominal pressure put on it. And this is one of the final things that I would like to show you. This is a fully automatic uh, strain calculation in 3D. You can see the Z, Y and X axis. Uh, and this was done with the images that were uh, automatically uh, segmented with the, um, the algorithm that we use. So we um, uh, had a, a, a software application and it goes too far to go into detail, um, but there are several ways in which you can uh, identify certain uh, parts of the muscle and, and follow them uh, in, in time to see where they move in order to calculate strain. Uh, but this is a contraction of a woman of her pelvic floor, in which you can see the blue lines which represent negative strain. So this is a contraction. And if you push on the pelvic floor, you will have a positive strain uh, during Vosalva. But this is uh, an image of a contraction. And you can see that while the woman is contracting, you can see that the pelvic floor muscle, the levator ani, becomes smaller, but you can also see that the strain uh, elements in the muscle um, are, are clearly indicating that there is a shortening or a contraction of the muscle. This was an image of before and completely after the contraction, but you still can see that after the contraction, there is still some strain visible in the muscle that was not there in, in, uh, in, the, in the beginning. So it needs some time for the muscle to relax. We can also look at Vazalfa, and this is an image of a Vazalfa in which you see that during pushing on the pelvic floor, the strain values become positive, so the muscle is uh, expanding. And at the end of the picture, you can also see that the hiatal genital, uh, genital hiatus is enlarging quite a bit. And that's like this. So this could be one of the patients that could be diagnosed with um, ballooning if we would have measured the, the, the area. What we also can do is look at the direction of the muscle fibers with the strain uh, measurements. And that might be very interesting in order to see what parts of the muscle uh, contract and what parts of the muscle are mainly there to support the pelvic organ, uh, organs. So this is also one of the um, options that we have with our uh, automatic um, uh, analyze of, this, of, the, of the strain. So uh, colleagues, um, the future is now. Um, what do I mean with that? Uh, I mean that the, we are close to standardizing the image acquisition. And again, I would really stress you to look at the UGA guidelines on how to use a pelvic floor ultrasound and how to record your data. And we might get some help from, uh, from the system when they uh, show us where the landmarks are. But then again, after that, there is the need for artificial intelligence. Um, we are able now to fully automate segmentations of the levator A9 uh, complex in 2D and working on 3D, um, but we need to train the system in recognizing levator A9 avulsions and other levator A9 damages. And strain measurements of the different parts of the levator A9 in order to get functional information of both the contractile as well as the supportive function are really uh, important. 
because we can try to use this information and translate it into the clinical practice. We might use it for selection of patients for a specific treatment. We might use it for a localization of a specific treatment or, or, or a specific uh, biofeedback uh, systems for, for certain parts of the muscle. Um, as I said, it, it might be very worthwhile uh, to look at strain um, uh, after, after delivery and also what pelvic floor muscle training exercises do on the strain and on the certain uh, parts of the muscle and whether or not structural damage uh, is important uh, in, um, uh, in reduced uh, strain or reduced contractility of the, of the muscle. But we can also use it, and that is, uh, uh, I think, very exciting stuff, to use uh, ultrasound in the future for uh, regenerative medicine. Um, nowadays, we are looking at, at stem cell, stem cell application. Uh, and especially after delivery, we know that the pelvic floor uh, muscle is, is damaged by the research of, of, of Shilton and also Dietz and many other groups. So there's no doubt about it that the levator A9 um, muscle is damaged uh, after delivery. Uh, the goal and the aim is to try to have a good regeneration of the muscle after uh, that it's been, been damaged. And certainly when we look at the prevalence of urinary incontinence and pelvic organ prolapse, at this stage we are still uh, far behind uh, what we would, would, would want to achieve and there's a lot, a lot to gain. So we might use the ultrasound to localize areas to be treated. Um, for instance, uh, should we look for techniques uh, in which we can uh, inject stem cells into an area that is uh, main, uh, mainly damaged, like a levatoration, uh, levator ani uh, avulsion area? Uh, but it might also be used as a surrogate marker for, um, for systemic uh, application. As we all know, pelvic organ prolapse only develops uh, or mainly develops uh, in, in women of middle age and, and, and older. So there is a great time lag between the initial uh, uh, trauma uh, at childbirth and the occurrence of pelvic organ prolapse. So if we want to induce a, a, a therapy, for instance, of stem, stem cells uh, after delivery in order to prevent pelvic organ prolapse, we simply do not have the time to wait for uh, 30 or 40 years to see the effect of it. So in that perspective, it would be very welcome if we could identify the effect of interventions on the function of the pelvic floor much more earlier. Uh, like I showed you, uh, it would be great if uh, techniques could be, uh, could be used that are able to show that the disability uh, of the pelvic floor does not stay increased uh, over time, but reduces also to uh, earlier values. Um, and that might be an indication that your uh, therapy might work. The future is now, but the last part uh, I presented you is really uh, something that um, uh, is uh, been looked at, but is not yet available. And we need to do a lot of research. But again, it starts with standardization of the acquisition and the analysis of our ultrasound data. So, dear colleagues, this is what I wanted to present to you in a, a one-way um, uh, presentation. Um, of course, uh, I would be welcome to discuss it with you. Uh, and as I said, I'm a, a gynecologist at the University Hospital in Utrecht uh, and easily to find on the internet. So if you uh, want to um, give comments or discuss uh, this presentation, you're more than welcome. And um, I'm looking forward to receiving uh, your questions or your uh, comments or recommendations because um, this is one part of the research. This is the way that I look at it. Uh, but uh, of course, there will be different uh, ways of looking at this problem and different opinions. But we need to have one goal, and that is to improve patient outcomes in the future. So with this being said, I would like to thank you for your uh, attention and uh, uh, stay safe. <laughs>